Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page, and it is Wednesday morning, April 27th, 2022, and we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 today, and we're going to start in verse 20. No, we're going to start verse 12. There's 20 verses in the chapter. I knew that didn't sound right. Anyway, glad to see folks joining on. Lyle, good to see you. Gail, good morning. And others who are joining on. As always, if you have any questions or comments while we're going, type them in the comments section here, and I will acknowledge them when I see them. We're cross-posted onto the Near Churches page, too. So you can do the same thing over there. Hey, Brian, good to see you. Hope you're doing well. All right, guys, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 12. So the first 11 verses we looked at yesterday, Paul was dealing with the issue of Christians taking other Christians to court, and that before non-believers. They should have had some folks wise enough amongst themselves to handle those types of situations. And it was, a, as he says, what was it, verse 7? An utter failure that you're doing this kind of thing. The better thing to do would be to accept the abuse, whatever was going on. You know, we're not told precisely what the problems were, why they were going to court, but they were. And uh, should have served as an embarrassment for them. Good morning, Lottie. Good morning, Linda. Good to have you guys with us today. So we get to verse 12, and Paul makes this statement here. He says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are, the New King James says, then helpful. I believe the King James says expedient. All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. All things are lawful. Are all things permissible for the Christian to engage in? Well, that's obviously not what he's talking about. There is a broader context here. And I think contextually what he's saying here is it may be lawful, that is legal, for a person to take another person to court. All right? I mean, that's that's kind of been a, one of the... What? One of the benefits of, of living in society is... In a somewhat civilized society, let's say, you have courts and you have laws and things like this. And so that may be lawful, but it's certainly not helpful. Okay, it's not an expedient. An expedient is, is something that helps you or assists you in, co in accomplishing that which is um, commanded, scripturally speaking. Well, it's it may be permissible, but I'm not going to do... I'm not going to do everything that I may be permitted to do as a child of God. Um, you know, there is this principle of self-control. Oh, and we'll talk about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, good morning, Harrisonville, Missouri. Glenia, that's what it looks like to me. I hope I pronounced that right. Good to have you today. Um, Okay, so anyway, verse 12, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient or helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And the end of verse 12 there is kind of interesting, because I will not be brought under the power of any. And, well, we'll just go ahead and read verse 13. Foods for the stomach, and the stomach for foods. But God will destroy both it and them. Um, thinking about that again contextually, there are things that can gain control of us. So let's say, again, looking at considering the first 11 verses and what Paul's talked about, the right, um, perhaps the legal right to take someone to court. Okay, I can do that. But as a Christian, should I do that? Should I take other Christians to court? Should I be brought under the control of that mindset? And I touched on that a bit yesterday. You know, we're big on talking about our rights, our our quote-unquote, God-given rights that are in the Constitution. It's quite interesting the way we frame that sometimes in, in our culture. But um, there are things that can, that can get control over us. We may find ourselves in a situation um, where uh, we're taken further than we had ever planned to go. Well, we need to be careful. Um, how do we use our body? You know, that's the question, and that's what Paul is going to get to here in the next few verses. Foods for the stomach and stomach for the foods. You know, we have natural appetites within us. God created man um, as a physical being. A physical being needs 
sustenance. And so those appetites never go away. And in fact, even in Scripture, those physical appetites are paralleled with spiritual appetites. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. You know, you're, you're, so I had breakfast this morning, very little bit. I don't think, I'm not crazy about eating big breakfast all the time, but I'll be hungry here in a little bit. And I drink, I drink water all day. Um, those appetites never go away. And that's how the body's designed. But the fact, hey, good morning, Connie. The fact of the matter is, that's how God created us. But something that we need to understand as we're conducting ourselves in this world as Christians, God's going to destroy both it, the body, and them, those things that fulfill those needs. Okay, we're looking then, obviously, forward to the end of time, to the judgment and things like this, the transition that will take place. You know, we're told um, when when the Lord returns at the, the last day, the judgment, uh, the resurrection, that our bodies, uh, Paul speaking to Christians in 1 Corinthians 15, they will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. We don't know what that's going to look like. I mean, John the Apostle even said that. We don't know what it'll be like, but there's going to be a change, and it'll happen in the amount of time it takes you to blink your eye. So what we have now, the way we exist now in this world is going to be changed. It's going to be destroyed, as it says here. But then he gets back to the uh, back to the point of, well, what is the body for here in 1 Corinthians 6, 13? The body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God will both raise up, God both raised up the Lord. Okay, that's already happened, obviously, when he wrote the book of 1 Corinthians. God raised Christ from the dead and will also raise us up by his power. Now, look at that. He ta- hey, Kiza, good to see you from Uganda. Glad you're here today. Um, you know, there are some folks who deny a future resurrection, even within churches of Christ. Uh, they believe all that happened in A.D. 70 and that it wasn't a physical resurrection. It was a spiritual resurrection. It's one of the most foolish doctrines I've ever dealt with. I mean, one verse right here utterly destroys their doctrine. God who uh, God both raised up the Lord, okay, we know how that happened, and will also raise us up by His power. He's talking about the body that will be destroyed, and it will be raised up just like Jesus' was raised up. So, back to the context, why or for what do you use your body? Well, it's not for fornication. Now, in Corinth, as we, again, I've covered this a, a couple times, and we dealt with it a lot, I guess you'd say, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, but remember, to you could Corinthianize. Uh, Corinth was known for its um, hedonistic lifestyle, living in pleasure. The Corinthians came out of that. Remember, uh, just, well, just back up in verse 11, such were some of you. And among that was fornication, um, adultery, homosexuality, sodomy. Such were some of you, but your body's not for that. That's You don't use yourself for those things anymore. Um, those things are going to be destroyed, and they're going to be changed, again, at the at the resurrection. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Obviously, he, again, talking about the individual Christians, we use our bodies in his service. Paul goes into a, a good chapter to read on that would be like Romans chapter 6. You don't yield yourselves, yield your members as servants of sin unto death, but of righteousness unto life through God. So, 1 Corinthians six fifteen. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then <clears throat> take members of Christ, your physical body, and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know... Now, he makes an interesting statement here, and I'm, we'll talk about this for a minute. Do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. Now, obviously, it's more than obvious what Paul's talking about here. You've got harlotry, fornication, joined to a harlot, you become one. The two shall become one. And that's talking about the physical act between two individuals. I don't know who that was. It's two days in a row. I've had visitors at 11 o'clock or so. So think about this. The the physical relationship between a man and a woman does not make a marriage, okay? If you are not married and you're having a sexual relationship with someone, you're committing fornication. So sex doesn't make a marriage, but marriage is the only place where that, um, 
uh, event, let's say, can take place. It's, it's, it's what makes you one with someone, whether you're married or not. But God has restricted that oneness for one place. And a verse to reference for that is like Hebrews 13 and verse 4. Um, marriage is honorable in all, or to be held in honor by all, and the bed is to be undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. There's one place where this union between a man and a woman is to be um, fulfilled, and that's within the bonds of marriage. But the, again, the, what I'm pointing out here is what he says in verse 16. Uh, he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her. For two, he says, shall become one flesh. Now that's a quote from Genesis 2, uh, the end of Genesis 2, when Adam, uh, when God created Eve for Adam. Uh, Jesus referenced that in Matthew chapter 19, but those are within the confines of marriage. But here he's, he's not talking about marriage. He's talking about fornication with a, with a harlot, with a whore. And still, that, those two become one in that act. So that act, the, sec, the, the sexual act, doesn't make a marriage, but it does make two people one. And this sin, and it's kind of pointed out here in the rest of this chapter of fornication, is unlike any other sin. And um, so anyway, let's, let's go on here and we'll talk more about that. But verse 17, now this is to the Corinthians and what he's already said in verse 15, your bodies are members of Christ. So he says in verse 17, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So just like in the physical union, two people become one, Spiritually, when you obey the gospel, when you're baptized into Christ, you become one with Christ. Flee fornication. All right. That's a command. Flee fornication. And so I wrote in the margin of my Bible, uh, Genesis 39, verses 11 and 12. And of course, that's, the, that's where Joseph is alone in the house with his master's wife, and she comes to him day by day, saying, lie with me. And, you know, he doesn't hang around and... Um, as I heard one man say, he didn't hang around and flirt with that temptation. It says he ran out, and he ran out to such an extent that she pulled the outer garment, the coat, let's say, off of his back. That's what was left in her hands. That's what it means to flee fornication. You don't mess with it. You get away from it. Um, and and that's for that's for a married person or an unmarried person. Now, when a married person commits fornication, they have also committed adultery. But um, the one place for this union between a man and a woman is marriage. So flee fornication. Now listen to this. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits fornication sins against his own body. Um, well, hey, Diana, good to see you. Uh, yeah, we miss having you here. And we know you've got a lot, I know you've got a lot on your plate, so it's good to hear from you, and uh, take care. Um, this sin is unlike any other sin. Now, we also need to understand here what he's saying. Every sin, so this is verse 18 again, every sin that a man does is outside the body. Now, our bodies, and again, this goes back to Romans chapter 6, where we, well, it's like Paul says in Romans, I think it's Romans six twelve. he says, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. And then from the beginning in verse 13, he says, Do you not know that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, that one's servants you are whom you obey, whether of sin unto, uh, sin unto death or of uh, obedience unto righteousness? <clears throat> so our bodies are the instruments that we use to sin. Now we also know that we can sin in the mind. You don't necessarily have to act out, okay? So, primary example. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, there's no physical action taking place, but the thought process is there. You better be careful. Um, also, in Matthew chapter 5, he talks about he who is angry with his brother without a cause, okay? Anger, that emotion, can become sinful. But this sin that we're dealing with here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is unlike any other because it makes you one with another individual that you have no right to be with. And it's, I tell you, over the years, 
Well, I'll, I'll preface what I'm about to say by saying this, and this is kind of sad, but nothing, nothing that I hear really anymore surprises me with members of the church, because I guess in, in 25 years of time and working with many congregations and knowing so many people, you just you hear of everything. And so I'm, I'm about to that point where I'm not like cynical and I don't trust anybody, but when I hear something happen with a Christian doing something, it's like, well, there you go. <laughs> it's almost like there's no surprise. Um, but even having said that, the, the command to flee fornication and what this does, it, <clears throat> it makes two people one, whether you're married or not. Um, this is a sin that affects, that was affecting the church at Corinth. Again, you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and the whole chapter's about that. And now he's talking about it here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we still hear about it today. I mean, how many times does Scripture condemn this behavior? I mean, again, through the life of Joseph, uh, the law of Moses, the teaching of Christ, the writings of the apostles. How many times do God's people have to be confronted with this message, and yet Christians still commit this sin of fornication? It's, it's kind of mind-blowing, you might say. Um, but anyway... He who commits fornication sins against his own body. You're never the same after that. Um, it's not just a physical connection. There's, um, I, I guess you would say, an emotional connection that's made as well. And, and frankly, when you, when you think about it, the way God has designed marriage and the relationship between a man and a woman, there's supposed to be that kind of connection. And no person should have that connection with someone who's not their spouse, physically or emotionally. And so, um, you sin against your own body. Cannot be undone. And the body's not for fornication, but for the Lord. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? So I, out to the margin of my Bible here, uh, with verse 19 and 20, I wrote out verse 11. Because back in verse 11, we're told, Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. When you obey the gospel, when a person obeys the gospel, they obey the death, burial, and resurrection. Okay, Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. They're raised up to walk in newness of life. They are now in intimate fellowship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6 teaches that, and so many other passages teach that. So for what are you using your body? Obviously, the Corinthians needed to hear this. Flee fornication. Don't use your body for that. The, the church, so he's talking to the individuals here, obviously the individual members of the church, but the church as a whole is referred to as the temple of God over in Ephesians chapter 2. Um, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 talks about that. A holy temple built up to the Lord out of living stones. That's what the church is. So individually, you better watch out what you use your body for. You're to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Not for the fulfillment of the lust of the flesh. So I think that's what we're dealing with here in verses 19 and 20. For you were bought with a price. Well, we know what that is here now. Verse 20, that's the blood of Christ. You were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So we are God's possession. We are his, it's like Titus, what is it, Titus 2 and verse um, uh, 12 and 13, I think it is. We are a peculiar people, zealous for good works. Well, that's the exact opposite of what would be going on here if you join yourself with a harlot. That, that, that makes you one with that person. And um, you're supposed to be one with the Lord, united with the Lord, a peculiar person zealous for good works. You have fellowship with Him. He dwells in you, you dwell in Him. And that's not some type of mystical bodily deity dwelling inside your body. It's the idea of fellowship. You are one. When you obey the gospel, you are one with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's Matthew 28 and verse 19. You are now in their possession. So use your body accordingly. Um, 
these Corinth, the, the, the church at Corinth had a lot of problems, and obviously this issue with fornication is one of them. And uh, you've got it in chapter 5, now you've got it again in chapter 6. So that's the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Um, Sheila says, sadly, it seems there is zero shame in fornication these days, so much so, well, so much so that people brag about it. Yeah, I mean, you think about inter our entertainment culture, um, the way, the way dating and relationships is portrayed, the way those things are portrayed on uh, television and movies and things, and, and you think about the sources of that, well, the folks who entertain us, who live, you know, in Hollywood, New York and stuff, I mean, they just, <laughs> the way I've said it before, they kind of pass each other around like a salt shaker. I mean, it's, it's like a free-for-all. And they're the ones that we choose to entertain ourselves with. Something to think about. Uh, but anyway, yeah, brag about it. Social media, pictures. Anyway, you could, I suppose you could talk a lot about that, but good point, Sheila. All right, guys, that is 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, we will plan on starting 1 Corinthians 7. And just so you know, we'll spend quite a bit of time in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It's, it's a longer chapter. 40 verses, um, but there's a lot here, and this chapter, the chapter 7, is in response to the things of which they wrote him, 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 1. So he, he addresses several different questions that obviously they wrote him. If you remember back in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, he refers to a letter that he had written them before 1 Corinthians. We don't have that. And we don't have the letter that they wrote to Paul asking these questions, but we know what they asked based on his answers here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate you being here today. So we'll start that tomorrow, and we'll just see how far we get. I'm not going to schedule this one out because there's so much here. All right, guys, thanks for being here today. Um, hope to see you back here tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Pick up in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You're welcome, Linda. Thank you for being here today. If you are unable to get out tonight, or perhaps you're in an area that doesn't have Wednesday night services, we'll be going live at 7 p.m. here at Mammoth Spring. And in the adult Bible class, I will be doing an overview of the book of Matthew. We finished our Old Testament overviews, and we're starting in the New Testament tonight. So, hope you guys have a good day, and hope to see you back here tomorrow at 11 o'clock.